coming from the audit background, I was used to always having a team around me. We always had staff and you're always helping other people. There's always a team involved. So going to the solopreneur route, which I'm grateful I now have a team again, but going those first few years on that solopreneur route can be very, very lonely at times and finding people that you can talk to and collaborate with and learn and grow from is huge. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a fantastic one. Our guest is the founder and owner of Four Corners CFO, a firm offering financial advisory services to small business owners. Danielle Hendon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. And uh, I know we're going to be talking about some interesting stuff today around money and planning. And so before we get into all of that, I would love to hear about you and your career journey leading up to what you're doing today. Yeah, it's um, it's got some twists and turns in it. So I started off as a music major in college. I sang through high school, went to college to sing, and realized very quickly when an English professor had us write about the future of our career that I was never going to make any money <laughs> <laughs> so I had some friends in accounting that were loving what they did, and I thought, oh, why not give that a try? I ended up getting my degree in accounting, getting my CPA, going into public accounting, all the things. And then when I started a family, I realized 80-hour work weeks and a newborn don't really mesh very well. So I left public accounting, and I went into corporate being in the Houston area, a lot of my expertise up to that point was in oil and gas. So when I left public accounting, I landed at an oil and gas company doing audit, internal audit. And I loved the company I was with. I loved who I worked with. I loved all that we were doing. They were a larger company, but they liked to think of themselves as a small business, very family feeling. And Things were great until they went through bankruptcy when oil prices tanked a few years ago. I guess more than a few years ago now. I got to start saying more like five or six years ago. I remember hearing about that. A lot of companies just got, yeah, just didn't make it. Yeah, so they came out the other side, owned by the bankers who started slicing and dicing. And then the pandemic hit and it became very clear the doors were going to close. Oh, so wow. it was kind of that opportunity for me to take a step back and ask myself what I wanted to do next. It was also what I will admit, a change in perspective for this workaholic mom. When you love what you do in your career, it's really easy to throw yourself into it and you're all in. And when the pandemic hit, it was an opportunity for me to be the get them to school mom, get them to swim mom, get to know the coaches and the friends and the teachers. And I realized I didn't want to give that up. So I had this unique opportunity, because I will be honest, oil and gas pays well even when they close the doors, of do I want to try something else? I could go back into corporate, I could run another audit department, or I could try doing something different and get to have that flexibility and time for my family. I was... I will say blessed with the opportunity to meet another fractional CFO who was very open and honest and was an ex-audit CPA as well. So we connected on all kinds of levels. And she basically said, you can do this. And so I did. I took a leap of faith and I opened Four Corners CFO. And I haven't looked back since. I never thought... I would look at a bankruptcy journey with gratitude, but I realized having gone from this billion dollar business down to, I think we were 20 people by the time I got let go, it was an opportunity to help downsize these big 
business concepts to really small business by the time things were done. I was the one the controller would call and say, hey, look, we've only got one person left to do this. Tell me what you want me to do. Because we still had to be compliant with all of the regulations. So figuring out how to make everything fit on a smaller scale is exactly what I now bring to my clients from a fractional CFO perspective. Wow. Wow. And and so making that shift to the, the small biz, I mean, I'd love to know w- w- the name. What, w- what inspired the name? So I did a lot of research and in Texas at least, and I know each CPA regulations are a little different by state. If I wanted to be a CPA firm, I would just have my name. It would be Danielle Hendon CPA. And I was like, well, that feels really boring. So we are not a CPA firm for that very reason. But to me, the four corners stands for the foundation that finances are in your business. You have to have those cornerstones in order to build a business that can be sustainable, profitable, and grow. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. I love that. So in starting the business, uh, this was a leap. You you had a, a good mentor uh, in the other fractional CFO. What was that leap like? Did, was it challenging? Did it just all work beautifully? Oh man, the scariest thing you've ever done in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Being, and I'm sure a lot of your bookkeepers can relate, we are type A personalities, number of people, the um, risk averse by nature. So taking a leap of that that size and magnitude, it was definitely a lot of budgeting and forecasting on the personal side to, to give myself that level of comfort that we can do this. And how long am I going to do this before we say yes or no? And does it work? And really just throwing yourself all in. Um I never realized how much I was going to love the interactions with other people. Again, most of us numbers people are not the first to step up in front of a crowd or go talk to somebody or do all of that networking stuff that's required to build a business. And I've, I've, I just love the conversations with other business owners. I love hearing about their experiences and I love any opportunity to help. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And so what would you say after making the big leap was your biggest challenge in growing the business? Learning how to market and network. And I think it probably applies to a lot of businesses, whether you're in bookkeeping or you're an attorney, or we all know how to do what we do really well. Uh, Learning how to grow a business was probably the biggest challenge. Finding, Finding a business bestie, I will say it that way, and somebody that you can turn to because business ownership can be very solitary sometimes. Mm. And coming from the audit background, I was used to always having a team around me. We always had staff and you're always helping other people. There's always a team involved. So going to the solopreneur route, which I'm grateful I now have a team again, but going those first few years on that solopreneur route can be very, very lonely at times and finding people that you can talk to and collaborate with and learn and grow from is huge. So true. Yeah, I hear that all the time. And definitely the the scaling of the business, the networking, the marketing is a is a big challenge. Um, and then so for you in your growth of your business, what would you say was a breakthrough moment for that area of the the growth, finding the the mar- figuring out the marketing, figuring out how to get new clients? Was there a breakthrough moment or something that just fig- f- felt right for you? So I would say there's probably two moments in the the growing of this business that have felt like a breakthrough. The first one was in really identifying what I want to offer and how I want to offer it. I started out probably like most people do, and I, I, I put everything in the kitchen sink on the website. These are all the things I can <laughs> do. And I had a business coach tell me, they don't know what they want. You need to tell them what they need. Mm. So it gave me the opportunity to build out the framework that I now use with every single one of my clients. No matter how we work together, we work through that same framework, and it helped me articulate that. So that was a huge moment for me. The other part I would say is leaning into the approachable accountant perspective of things, being the person that's not going to talk in all of the lingo, that knows how to speak plain English and talk about what's going on in your business, and really just able to come partner with those other business owners and referral partners. I am not your traditional stuffy CPA that's going to talk up here and sound like I know all the things, and I will be the first to tell you if I don't know, but I'm going to go find it out. 
Mm, very cool. That's great. And some, some cool breakthroughs in your journey. What about breakdowns? What, what was like a brick wall that just was difficult to get over in growing your business? I wouldn't call it a breakdown because I did get through it. And I, I know it's a topic that we're probably going to talk a little bit more on today is, is hiring that first person. Because again, type A, very control freak kind of personality. It is really hard to let go of, especially in small business when you feel like this is the baby you've built, right? This is, this is your everything. To let go of any part of it can be very difficult. And it took me honestly, a lot longer than I'd like to admit and longer than it should have for me to hire the the first people on my staff and say, okay, let's do this. I can trust somebody else to help me figure this out. Very cool. Very cool. And that, that was yeah, definitely on the list uh, to talk about. So great transition. I'd love to hear that story and, you know, the, 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 the pieces that, you know, what looking back, what did have it take so long? Those are always such gifts to our, ourselves, but also hear, allowing our listeners to hear about it when you realize, oh yeah, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But for someone who hasn't gone through it yet, it's uh, magical, magical information. So I'd love to hear that. So my very, I'll go back to the very, very first. The very first person I hired from an outsourced perspective was an assistant. I, like I said, marketing was definitely something I knew I was struggling with and keeping up with all of it just felt enormous. And I knew I needed help staying in touch with people because I didn't want to feel like I was dropping the ball or forgot to email somebody back. So hiring a virtual assistant was the very first thing that I did. And again, being a numbers person, it was like, okay, so can I afford and what can I afford and running and crunching all the numbers. But even when all the numbers make sense, and I've seen this every time I bring a new team member on, whether it's outsourced or internally, I can crunch the numbers all day long and make them make sense, but there's always a little bit of leap of faith in there. They, they're, you always have to take a little bit of a, okay, we're just going to do it. Because even when all the numbers look good, it can still feel scary. And I will say my very first outsourced hire was a virtual assistant through an agency that does virtual assistant work. She does great work. I had a great rapport with her. She's actually now a client of mine. And it was the marketing side because I knew I couldn't keep up with it. I was trying to give away the world and have all the information and give give everything I could. And I just wasn't doing it effectively or efficiently or in a really timely manner. I could spend all day long in referral meetings and make new connections and conversations. But if I didn't have the time to follow up with them or if I forgot or if things fell through the, the cracks, then you're not building that trust in that relationship. So that was my very first hire. My first internal hire, the person doing what I do that helps me do the accounting side, was actually someone that I had worked with in the previous company. I made a couple of attempts at hiring somebody I didn't know, and I felt like it always sort of didn't quite line up. So then I turned to some of the people I knew that had also left that oil and gas company that were at home with their kids that wanted the flexibility and the remote work environment. And I said, look, I know that we've worked really great together in the past. And if you've seen any of, if anyone sees like my meet the team, the, the person I'm talking about right now, her name's Brittany. She's amazing. And she is, because we had that historical rapport, she was able to take what I was doing and help me translate it so that when we did hire that next person that was completely outside of the company, she had the time and the space and the capability to actually put it together in a way that made more sense. Whereas when you're in that position, and again, because I waited too long, <laughs> mm -hmm. when you're in that position, you're doing all the doing so fast that you don't even realize how quick you're like alt-tabbing between things and running and flying. And people are like, wait, slow down. What did you just do? Somebody that knows your style, knows something like that, that you and can kind of follow along and then translate it down so that the next person can do it at an even more structured pace and speed was was huge for me. And it's worked out really well to do it that way. I will also say I am a huge fan of clockwork. 
by Mike Michalowicz. If you mm-hmm. haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And we did that. I recorded myself doing it. And then Brittany was able to take that recording and then she would record the next one. She could do it slower. She had more time and capacity to show the details and take a little more time with it. But she also knew me enough to be able to pause, go through, and wasn't hesitant to reach out and ask questions if she had them. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So it took a while for you to get there. What was it that had you, I guess, make the decision to go ahead and do it at that time? Um, you talked about looking at your numbers and the K- KPIs, all that good stuff, but there was like that that little bit, the, the uncertainty. What What had you finally take the leap? I didn't want to be my own ceiling, and I knew I was at that time. You, as a solopreneur and as service providers, like all your bookkeepers are, we can only give so many hours in the day. And I remember my husband telling me I had worked myself back into the same job that I had left to give flexibility. Like, I had gotten to the point where the hours were just as consuming as they would have been in corporate. And that defeated the purpose of why I started all of this. And that reminder of I don't want to be in the business or on the business 100% of the time. I want to be there for my family. I want to be there for the kids. I want to be there for my friends. And that's where I was like, either I hire somebody or I've got to stop growing. And I want to keep growing because I want to bring all of this information to everybody I can. So that means I have to hire help. Absolutely. So, and I guess that's, that's the trick of it is you waited too long. What would you say the key, like for our listener, when, when will they know it's the right time and maybe even before the right time? Cause that's what I'm kind of getting. What is the, 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 the right time before the right time? <laughs> I guess you could so say I funny way of saying it. The trigger I would say We all know that as service providers, you are working on your business and you're working in your business. Mm -hmm. When you start giving up the time that you're working on on your business to work in your business, then you probably need to be hiring somebody to work in your business for you. Mm-hmm. That's really good. So you're you're no longer working on the business. You're just you're working in a job mm-hmm. in your business, and that's not going in the trajectory of of, of having an actual business uh, together. And then from a from a, from a financial perspective, or or key performance indicator, w- w- were there other metrics that you were looking at? You know, this this needs to change, or we can do this now. What did that look like? So like I said, I'm I'm a numbers cruncher, as I'm sure many of your audience is. So it's always looking at what is the trajectory of our revenue? How many clients have we brought on? When did I bring them on? And how many do we think we're going to bring on in the future? And mapping that against, honestly, it was mapping it against how much would I need to pay for an accountant at the level that I would want that accountant to be. And balancing out getting back into your pricing and kind of balancing out how many hours would they need? Are we pricing the right amount? Does this look right? How many clients could that one person take on effectively? And I tell this to my clients too, but I personally did it in my business when I was hiring. It was probably going to take the first person I hired twice as long as it takes me to go through whatever I was doing. And what does that look like from a profit margin? And that that is the key indicator financially is looking at your gross profit margin. And because we all know you can make all kinds of cuts in net profit margin if you really want to. All those operating expenses are flexible to the extent that they aren't required to run the business. But if you are going to hire someone that is revenue generating, first of all, they have to be revenue generating. Is the the hourly or the package price you're offering going to cover your operating expenses and that person? But then also, do you have enough profit margin right now to make that higher? However, I will say this is where some of the leap of faith comes in. If you do not have it right now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't hire. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. That's the that's the trick of it is that it's you can't in some cases you can't get to 
that next level without it. And if you wait to when you're ready, you won't have the the resources or time. You get stuck, I think, Mm -hmm. Uh, which you talked about, you know, if you're fully working on the business and not, or in the business and not on it, then how are you going to actually have the time to, to do the things you need to do to hire them, find them, train them, get them up to speed. And it's always going to take longer than you think. That's right. Everything always takes longer than we think. <laughs> and that's, uh, keeps being, I keep being reminded of that in my life all over the place. And so with that, did you have to make other adjustments to your business model in order to have staff? Because you're, you're solo, you're doing the work, and all of a sudden you're bringing people on. What did, the, what did that look like? Was, did you have to change your pricing? Did you have to make other changes in the business? So I did not change the pricing, sorry, I did not change the pricing that I have for clients. What I did end up having to do was take a, well, I had to turn the lens on myself. The thing that I do for all of my clients and looking at their budget and their expenses, I had to flip it around and look at mine and say, what is or isn't returning on investment in my business? Am I spending too much here or there? And I'll be honest, I love learning and I love teaching and I love showing people things. And I probably, I cut my coaching budget, my my self-development budget at one point because I had um, multiple coaches that I was turning to for different things. And I realized I, as much as I love learning these things, they're worth nothing if I can't implement them. And instead of hiring coaches, I need to hire doers in my business. And that was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And now uh, after a couple of hires and going through this, was, did that change? Did that, um, did you have to make other changes as the team got bigger? And that's, for me, that's where that clockwork book came in huge. I love, like I said, I love everything about the clockwork process, but learning that you don't have to write SOPs, you don't have, you don't have to have it all figured out when you make that hire. You can record as you go. And actually, Brittany told me at one point that she loved that I would record it and be problem solving at the same time. Those recordings don't have to be perfect. They're, oh man, that didn't matter. Let me go look over here and let's try that. And it's just narrating the process as you go. And they get to see not just how to do it, but how you think about it when you're going through and you're problem solving. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, so now that you've done that, do you see any other changes to your business from, from here, like where you've built it to this day? What's the next level for you? For me personally, it's going to be continuing to grow that team and also jumping through the hurdle that I help so many of my clients when you start growing an administrative team. The next hurdle is hiring people that are not revenue generating, but they help build efficiencies and productivity in your business, which turns into profitability. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so with that, I guess you're hiring non-revenue generating people, which is, which is, they're going to work on other pieces of the business. That's the next level for you. Stepping back, I did want to know though around any barriers or challenges that you faced when you were hiring? Did you have some hires that didn't work out that didn't provide, obviously you've got your metrics that you're trying to fulfill on. Well, how did that, did that go wrong or sideways for you? Yes. So I, at first I actually tried to get my assistants to help with some of the accounting and I realized very quick, that's where I realized I needed a bridge. I needed to find somebody that can bridge the gap between me and a and a a staff level person of what that would look like. And that, that was a huge breakthrough for me along with, I won't say we, I haven't hired anybody that didn't work out, but I know during the interview process, it became very clear that I needed to articulate what I was looking for very specifically. It needed to be It wasn't that we weren't looking for a bookkeeper. We weren't looking for um, an accountant. We were looking for a certain analytical skill. And I got some really great advice from another business owner about using 
a miniature quiz of sorts to help identify that skill because I was struggling to articulate it. And essentially what we ended up doing is in our interview application process, there was a question that said, hey, if we have a client who's budgeted $1,000 for travel, but it came in at 200, help me write an analytic that would explain what happened or what you think might have happened. And that was able to help me probably better than any resume, any other question on that application, identify kind of that analytical skill that we were looking for. It's very cool. Now in the work that you do, is this translated to how you're helping your clients uh, in in their own businesses? Oh, all the time. The number crunching part of it, which is probably what I love most, but also empowering them to make the decision and telling them, look, we've crunched the numbers. We know this will work. Worst case scenario, if it doesn't, this is what happens. And helping them make that leap of faith because I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to sit there and be like, but what if I have to pay somebody and I don't have money? And that's where knowing your numbers is so critical and so important. So many business owners, when they first come to me, are doing what I would call bank statement accounting. The bookkeepers are doing the bookkeeping, and they're just checking on the bank statement to see where things are and don't always feel confident that they can afford what they what they want or what they need. So we do a lot of, on the front end, we look at First of all, do you have a line of credit? That's my very first thing that we look for is I think every business should have a line of credit. They're not as easy to get as we're recording this right now. In these times, they're not as easy to get, and the interest rates are less than ideal. But it gives you enough wiggle room, breathing room to make the best decision for your business. And it can take, up, especially in the accounting world, it can take up to three months for somebody to really be up to speed on your processes. If you think about accounting and bookkeeping, so much of what you do is monthly. So they're going to spend the first month learning it and following along. They're going to spend the second month doing it themselves and trying to figure it out. It's going to be three months before they're doing it independently. Three months before you can really step back from that. And you, so that means we need three months of revenue and cushion to pay that person where they're not necessarily going to be generating the revenue we want yet. And that applies to almost every service-based business. It's going to take months for a new employee to get up to speed. So a line of credit can come in really helpful. And that's where I say, you don't wait until you have the profit. Let's build the profit and make sure in those three months while you're getting that person up to speed, you're also networking your butt off. You're out there selling. You're out there doing the things. We're building up the clients to help fill that person that we've hired. And I also love helping them Like I said, when it comes to crunching the numbers, we do a lot of what I call capacity planning or capacity budgeting. So it's how much time does this person have? How many clients could you give them? And what does that revenue look like if you had them? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, definitely in the uh, the accounting industry, the it's not a, a question of whether it's possible or not, right? It's absolutely anyone can have any size business they want in this industry. There's so many clients that need the help. Um, yet some companies struggle or people struggle to get clients and different things like this. And, and so it's not like it's easy, but it's possible. And so yeah. with the right plan and with the right actions and taking those things on, figuring out where one is strong, where one is not so strong in their own business, like you said, in the beginning, you had the things you were strong at and you knew where you were were not as strong at. So figuring out how to make all of that work. But it's like investing in a business like that, with whether it's a line of credit or you're taking savings, whatever the case may be. It's a good bet. <laughs> it's a, it's good a pretty good bet. Right? Um, but, the, you know, where does the investment go wrong? I'd love to get your take on that if you've seen people. Because uh, certainly people go, well, they invest. It's, you know, it's a sure shot. But yet they don't do the right actions. They don't, they don't follow the plan. They don't stick to the, the game, right? They yep. um, deviate from the known path. Uh, how, how, what have you seen? And how do you keep on the right path? 
Yeah, so I will take attorneys as an example. I have a lot of attorneys that are clients, and I have one that is struggling with um, a recent hire. And the first thing you have to know is what does it mean? What are the expectations for that hire? You have to set those expectations so you know what you're looking for them to be able to do. And you have to then go back and see if they're doing it. So we spend a lot of time, and it applies to bookkeepers as well when you guys are growing your business, looking at how much time do you think something should take and then actually looking at timesheets because I know trust me I know I don't like tracking time either I had to do it in the firm and I hate it Mm -hmm. but you have to look back at those timesheets and make sure everybody is tracking their time so that you can see let's say you thought you gave a bookkeeper a project and you thought it was going to take them five hours but they come back and it took 10 Now, that's not to say there's something wrong with the bookkeeper, but you need to ask, just like you would in budget to actuals, why are we not meeting the expectation? Do they not have the training? Do they not have the tools? Do they feel afraid to ask questions? Like, what's going on that caused this to take twice as long? Or is my expectation just wrong? And we need to then go back and look at pricing, because if it's going to take 10 hours, then we need to adjust. Mm -hmm. So true. The, The fundamental law or rule of of business is what gets measured gets managed and so mm-hmm. that's probably one of the, the the places that that any business falls down is they're not measuring a the not the right things uh therefore they're not managing it and and that's where it can go sideways pretty quickly yeah, and I've seen it across service-based industries. Like I said, we every attorney client I have, when we're modeling their revenue, the very first thing I ask them is, how many hours do you think each of these things takes, especially if they're a flat fee thing? I want to know, what are the hours that go in? And then we run those reports at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, depending on the client, and say, how many hours did it actually take? And are we getting what we thought it would take out of it? Mm-hmm. So interesting. Fascinating stuff. And some great tips on on how to actually get this done, some ideas on how to get it done inside our listeners' bookkeeping business. If we, if the listener wanted to learn more about you, Danielle, or get more resources or learn more about the things that you're doing, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, my website is probably the best way to reach me. It's going to be the number four corners cfo.com and we will have a landing page just for your listeners so it'll be four corners cfo.com slash successful bookkeeper beautiful well, that's fantastic well this has been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your past your your what am i trying to say <laughs> your past experiences where you are now and where and where you're headed. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was this was a joy. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources. You can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.